Okay, very good. So let me just, um, firstly, this is the, the cover page of the report, which was uh, Adrian just mentioned a moment ago. Um, this came out in June this year. And I would just note that the book actually, as we're a public organization, paid, our work is paid for by taxpayers. And this, this book, there's no uh, paywall, it's free. If you want to circulate the, the link, uh, that we'd very much welcome that. So uh, I'm not going to attempt to reprise the 35 chapters in the book, we cover a wide range of topics, and obviously there's not time here uh, today. But I'll just focus on four issues very briefly. One about a contention that science may be getting harder, which relates to the possible offsetting implications of AI. Look at the role of AI in science today and tomorrow. Describe what we know so far about the impacts of AI in science, and then say a few words about what governments can do and universities might do to try and accelerate and deepen the use of AI in science. So first there is science getting harder. This, um, the idea that science may be getting harder is not, a, is not a new one, it's quite old, it goes back to Charles Babbage and before. And Interest, though, has been spurred in this question in recent years by this paper, which was authored by four very well-known, globally renowned economists who put forward uh, a number of types of evidence suggesting that ideas may be getting harder to find. Now, I'm not going to elaborate here on all the arguments why the productivity of science may be may be sluggish, these are examined in detail in the opening chapters of the book, and you'll find those arguments elaborated there. Uh, I'll, I'll just note that the claim is not that science is not progressing, it clearly is by leaps and bounds, but the claim is that for each increment of new knowledge, we require ever greater increments of inputs into the science system. Now, this is a contentious claim, but there is some evidence to support it. I'll just mention two issues here because in this connection, because they're relevant to what AI can do to help offset some of those factors which may serve as a drag on the productivity of science. The first has to do with managing information overload. So uh, the average scientist today reads about 250 papers a year, but in the, uh, the biomedical field alone, more than 1 million papers are put into the PubMed database annually. That's about two papers per minute. And you see here, this is the annual number of scientific publications from 96 to 2018. So just during the first 12 months of the pandemic, 100,000 scientific articles were authored on the coronavirus. So clearly no one today can be a Renaissance person, a Renaissance man. Um, and this knowledge burden, if you like, is reflected in a whole series of metrics. You could look at the, the age of the first solo article in economics is rising, the age of the first solo article in mathematics, the number of references cited, the, um, the increasing prevalence of teams in science because no individual person can only do what Michelangelo could do in, in the past. At the same time, um, it may just be, as some scholars argue, that the low-hanging fruits of knowledge have now been picked, perhaps represented graphically in equations like this. You'd have the, say, at the top, Newton's second law of motion taught in high schools, going right down to this equation from, at the bottom, from the string theory of black holes, which perhaps only a few hundred people in the world can, uh, can comprehend. So that's one element of, of of backdrop is that there are there are challenges to increasing the productivity of science at the same time we need more and better science in part because we're facing very time constrained global challenges particularly around climate change but around other things too um so ai what's it doing in science today well ai is penetrating all fields and all steps in the scientific process and if i just give some examples perhaps the major application today is in prediction, and perhaps the most widely publicized recent breakthrough using AI was DeepMind's uh, development of a model, AlphaFold2, to predict protein folding. Um, that is to predict the three-dimensional shape of proteins 
from the sequence of the amino acids that make up the proteins. And being able to do so helps researchers to determine the function of the proteins. Um, and for instance, most drug discovery starts with finding the right protein to target the right disease. And so this breakthrough has really sparked a, a revolution in molecular biology. Um, but AI's applications go well beyond prediction. So AI, for instance, is playing an increasing role in generating hypotheses from um, from very large data sets uh, based on patterns, ex pattern extraction um, from data sets. This is, for example, an image of a, a proton fragmentation from a Large Hadron Collider. These data sets obviously are far beyond human comprehension. Um, a use of AI, which is doesn't really get front page coverage, um, is using AI, in particular, a technique called literature based discovery to find knowledge that we don't know that we have. That's to say undiscovered public knowledge. And the idea is that um, that repositories of knowledge, specialized um, archives of scientific literature, know how which is perhaps most known by uh, scientific communities, which are, are work at great distance from other scientific communities, that perhaps we can establish, build conceptual bridges between the, the knowledge in those different fields, otherwise separated fields that don't touch, and generate new knowledge. It, it, the idea is that even if there was a moratorium on research today, we might still be able to generate knowledge just by connecting what we already know um, from, from disparate fields of science. So the idea is that, say, book one may show that A, A affects B, another book, book two, may show that B affects C, and then it's reasonable to conjecture that A may affect C and therefore to build hypotheses and experiments in that connection. And this whole field of literature based discovery uh, was actually central to the um, to drug repurposing, to give gave birth to the whole uh, the whole arena of drug repur repurposing. That's investigating um, existing drugs for new therapeutic purposes. AI has been used in novel forms of simulation simulating the behavior of chaotic systems, for example, out to distant time horizons. Um, something that's rarely talked about is that AI is revolutionizing microscopy. So, for example, finding just the most important parts of an image to avoid, for instance, exposing delicate biological structures to too much harmful light. And AI is being used in research assistance that I'll come back to in a moment. There are many other possible AI applications. There's work being done with AI to plan experiments, to choose the most efficient experiments. There's a number of trials underway using AI in peer review for allocating papers in an optimal way to peer reviewers to support citizen science. One of the most exciting developments has to do with AI-enabled laboratory robots. So robots, as I'm sure everyone's aware, have been used for many years to automate routine laboratory processes. But AI-driven lab robots can now go beyond this mechanical task and they can execute cycles of testing. They can uh, generate hypotheses based on the results of that testing, and then they can set up new tests to examine the validity or not of the hypotheses. And they can do this within closed loop cycles with minimum human involvement. And this is particularly for lab-based science that involves large combinatorics. And here is one of the contributors to our to our book, Professor Ross King, who's at Cambridge and Chalmers University. And he's standing in front of the first um, AI enabled uh, lab robot. Adam is the first system to explicitly form hypotheses and experiments and then to physically do the experiments. And he's also the first system which is credited with having made an independent scientific discovery. So it, it came across, it eventually identified a compound, triclosan, which is effective against a drug-resistant strain of the malaria parasite. So what do we know about the effects of these systems then on research productivity? What are their impacts? So this is a, lab, this is a, a robot chemist at the University of Liverpool. Um, using AI, you can explore um, almost 100 million possible experiments and choose which to do next based on previous test results. And it operates for days, 24 seven, stopping only to recharge its own batteries. And so it's particularly valuable having a system like this during the pandemic, of course. Now, not only 
is there are huge and obvious efficiency gains from a system such as this. But one virtue of these um, uh, these mechanisms is that they can automatically record all the metadata in experiments. So precise data on the exact protocols followed during an experiment. For human performed experiments, this amounts to about 15% of the cost of experiments on average, but humans make mistakes in recording the metadata, which also undermines replicability of science. Um, so there's, there's much to be gained then. The men, this is an additional merit of using systems of this sort. Um, money can be saved by intelligent data sampling, so the AI can help find which bit of a large data set will tell us most about all of the data and just use scarce computational dollars or euros to focus on the most sensitive bits of the data. And going back to the issue of intelligent research assistance, um, about 44% of the time of the entire population of scientists in the United States is taken up with preparing grant proposals, most of which go unfunded. That's a huge cost to society to prepare proposals which are not, not funded. In this piece of uh, this reference here from Australia, 400 years of researchers' time was spent preparing unfunded grant proposals for just one health research fund in, in Australia. If you add up the cost of scientists' time, particularly those scientists who are doing peer review, just in the US in one year, that amounted to $1.5 billion in 2020. So, um, we've been working with, and um, one of the chapters in the book is about uh, one of the AI, one of the leading AI research assistant systems called Illicit, which is based initially on GPT-3, and they've shown, or they have at least good, good, good indications that they can compress, they can telescope down the time taken to prepare research proposals from months to weeks. So that when you consider the magnitude of the social outlays there for the time of scientists who are really not producing new science. This could be a major boost to the efficiency, to the productivity of science systems. And we have um, empirical research, say, with, with um, control groups. This work I'm citing here done at MIT, looking at how chat GDP had increased average productivity in writing time, improved creativity and so forth. So what then can governments do? What can public policy do to, to help? There's a few things which we think are important and which we describe in detail in the book. And the first is to help fund, organize, um, coordinate ambitious multidisciplinary programs which marry AI with science. And so obviously for an audience like, like this one, for any kind of uh, gathering of people who know about science systems, the call for more multidisciplinarity is, is extremely frequent. But environments, in environments that don't encourage multidisciplinarity, specialists in different domains or fields of science, whether it's physics or engineering or biology, etc., but who want to use AI in their research, they're often separated from the wider machine learning community. And using machine learning well, using AI well in science, is not straightforward, it's not a plug and play technology. In fact, when you look at papers submitted to AI research conferences, those papers have a lower rate of replicability than papers in any other field of science, with physics actually being the area where replicability is highest. So this points out just how difficult it is to do um, combine AI with domain special, specialized knowledge in ways which, which lead to uh, high quality research. And an example of an ambitious multidisciplinary program is this, uh, the Turing AI Scientist Grand Challenge. And this began a few years back as a meeting of scientists at the Alan Turing Institute in London. And these scientists have been developing a roadmap that would um, kind of chart the course to the creation of an AI system that could win a Nobel Prize in science um, semi-autonomously by 2050. In designing sort of moonshots or if you like Apollo programs, 
around AI and science. Governments could help at focus efforts on global challenges. So I just talked a moment ago about literature-based discovery, but only 6% of all publications which have used literature-based discovery, only 6%, a tiny fraction, can be mapped to at least one of the sustainable development goals. I'll just move on here. Um, obviously, computational constraints matter in this field, especially for less well-resourced institutions and for, and for uh, poorer countries. And there's much that can be done with national laboratories, um, uh, centers of high performance computing, working with industry and academia to, to nurture AI ecosystems for tertiary education. For example, to, to create step up guides from basic skills on up. So moving from work on personal computers right up to uh, small scale cloud resources, to larger cloud resources, then to even to national systems. So there's a variety of proposals in the book for how that might be done. And governments could also explore pooling resources internationally. So you can imagine smaller countries that have fewer supercomputers in their, their national reserve, and um, they, uh, they could be linked together to share capacity. And uh, actually this year, under the EU-Japan Digital Partnership, an action is being launched to provide mutual access to high performance computing between the EU and Japan. And insights from how that framework has been designed could be applied in future to pool resources internationally, perhaps even with developing countries, for example. Uh, there's work that could be done on curricula. So the standard bioscience education curriculum, for example, doesn't address how to search for new hypotheses in the ways that I just mentioned. Uh, there's a lot that could be done to promote research software engineering uh, career trajectories. Um, there was survey work done at Cambridge University recently trying to assess which are the skills, the digital skills, in, uh, for which there's greatest demand and need. And it didn't turn out to be people with high grade machine learning expertise. It turned out to be the software engineers, the people who bridge between the domain specialists and the, and the computer systems on which the research is done. Um, and also there's very little awareness in curricula about the stage of development of the sort of robot systems, which I've just pointed to a moment ago. Public R&D can also advance the field in many ways. So let me just think here, I talked about AlphaFold at the beginning, but AlphaFold, despite how impactful its advances, its achievements are, um, it, it did not generate much understanding of the underlying mechanisms of prompt protein folding. So it didn't provide a model that could appear and be taught in a textbook with which to educate the next generation. So we need new tools to help explain, for example, what's, what's happening inside the black box. We're also in a world where there's evidence of a narrowing of AI research. So if you look on the, the right, the blue pyramid, this would represent spending on AI R&D done by the high by the large tech firms. And then on the left, the sand colored pyramid is the, the R&D done by the public research organizations and universities. The spending by the large tech firms is uh, multiples of public spending. It's growing faster and it's drawing off the talent. So 21% of AI PhDs in the US um, went into industry in 2004 and it's 70% and maybe more, it was 70% in 2020, maybe more now. And an important consideration here is that if you look at the, the width of the base of these pyramids, this represents research diversity. So the diversity of research that's, that is had in the large tech companies is much narrower than the diversity of research in the universities and the public research organizations. And when you look at the elite universities, the Stanford's and MIT's of the world, these are the universities that collaborate most closely with the large tech companies. And these universities have a much narrower research agenda than do than does the rest of the base of universities and public research organizations. And the large tech companies are very much focused on uh, using large models, huge data sets, very compute intensive approaches. And so there's work that could be funded there by the public sector to try and address this huge governance issue, the disproportionate role of large tech companies in driving research agendas in this field. 
So the public sector can help foster more blue sky thinking and putting money into funding streams or publication processes to reward novel methods and may require greater patience and tolerance of failure. There's things which governments could fund in research which are really not of interest really to the private sector, they're much underinvested in. And one could be to develop specialized tools to enhance collaboration between humans and AI systems, so human AI teams, and to integrate these tools into mainstream science. We have evidence that these teams can outperform humans alone or even AI alone in some applications. And so this would be a prime target for, for uh, public investment. I'm just going to mention two more issues before I end about research governance. One, of course, and I think it goes back to points which were, which were made by Matthew uh, a moment ago. Um, and that has to do with the, the role of chat GPT and large language models in scientific processes and in research governance. And as I'm sure we're all aware that with the advent of chat GPT, um, there was a flurry of articles that appeared in, in Nature and Science and other journals expressing fears that these systems might give rise to increases in fraud, uh, in fraud or plagiarism or lead to more shallow work, that, they, that science could be contaminated by the hallucinations or confabulations of these systems when they just make up references, for example, and concerns about, you know, whether we need new guidelines on how these systems should be used in uh, peer review tasks or, um, uh, or in other aspects of research governance. Now, these, get, these debates are ongoing. There's no sort of no consensus about how the norms might need to change. And I think that the, it's a moving target because as LLMs acquire more capabilities, the nature of the issues to be discussed will also change. And I think that there's many ways in which LLMs could be hugely beneficial for science and some of the claimed problems like the propensity to hallucinate just to create uh, fiction um, could even be useful in some aspects of science we want clever ideation we want clever interlocutors even if they get things wrong so long as they're getting things wrong in intelligent ways that can spark new thoughts new ideas that could be useful and um so there's much more to say in that connection but i don't think that uh, all of what LLMs in the research process could entail are, are, are things to be worried about. Um, my last point has to do with the dangers of dual use of AI in drug discovery. So last year, scientists at a biopharma company called Collaborations Pharmaceuticals, they gave an alarming demonstration. So they did this just to raise a red flag. And this is a company which uses machine learning to identify molecules for um, therapeutic purposes for large pharma companies. And in so doing, their systems are trained to identify molecules with minimal toxicity. But they showed that they could flip the algorithms on their systems such that they could take publicly available data and maximize the toxicity of the molecular designs. And in the space of just a few hours, they came to the design for 40,000 molecules, many of which are more deadly than the most lethal agents held in government, uh, in government arsenals. So if I'm a bad actor today and I want to create dangerous molecules to use them in harmful ways, um, I, I need a team of uh, toxicologists and chemists, et cetera, to help me. But going back to lab robots, it may be that sometime in the near future, even this, could be automated and that all I need to do is to is to acquire these systems which will become cheaper and easier to use. And so there's a governance question which is, is not a new governance question because they're entirely because we've had um, problems with you know thoughts about dual use um, the dual uses of in, in many domains of science for many decades but what to do is something that uh, that needs needs more attention. So with that, I will I will leave you and just say that this is a fast moving field um, it may well be that things have moved on considerably a year from now. Um, and it may be that despite the fact that so much regulation and public debate around AI is concerned with issues of, of privacy and so on and the role of large tech companies and social media, it may be that AI in science turns out to be 
ultimately the most important of all of the uses of AI in science. So with that, I'll leave you. Thank you very much.